Welcome to Module 4. In this module, we're going to be discussing basic wound care. And the first point of discussion is going to be general patient room setup. If you have a larger burn coming into your center, let's say 30% or greater, this is going to pertain to you. Although you're used to taking care of ICU patients, there's going to be a few variations in taking care of large burn patients. First thing that you're going to want to do is to heat up your room. Turn up the heating as much as you can because these patients are obviously going to be thermoregulatory challenged. The next thing that you're going to want to have available to you is a bear hugger or other warming blanket device along with the blanket itself that can be hooked to such device. Another thing that you're going to want to use to maintain thermoregulation in your patient is heating lamps if you have them in your room, such as the overhead ones that we have here, or other commercial available devices such as this, that will also aid in helping thermoregulation in your patient. If you have a NICU or other ICUs in your hospital, they may be a wealth of resource for warming devices such as this. You're also going to want fluid warmers and rapid infusers at least two suction setups on the wall, one for nasal gastric decompression and the other for respiratory and ventilator. Your basic ICU monitor and the setup for basic hemodynamics like non-invasive blood pressure, pulse oximetry, and EKG. With the items that we've already discussed, other items that you may find in your cache that can be used for larger burn patients are IV pumps, nasal gastric tubes, initially for gastric decompression, and then for feeding, along with the feeding pump. Along with basic room setup, you're now going to want to get set up to take care of your burn patient with the dressings. So as you'll find on your cache, we have a whole bevy of things here that's going to help you with your wound care. The first thing is the debridement tray. This is going to have things like pickups, sharp scissors like tenotomies, and other items to help you debride and clean up wounds. Next thing you're going to have are your dry burn dressings. Come in one size, two different size packages. They're 18 by 18 dry burn dressings, one being a 10 ply package, the other being a 50 ply package. Obviously the 50 ply package is going to be used for larger exudative wounds and wounds that you know are going to become pretty messy. Next we have fine mesh gauze. This gauze will probably be used more later if your burn patient stays with you after debridement. Curlex. You'll find a large amount of Curlex in your cache that's going to help wrap all your wounds. These will be used on the head, bilateral upper extremities, and bilateral lower extremities. Burn netting. This is what we're going to use to help keep your dressings in place, which we'll show you later on. You're going to have four different sizes. Size 1 for your fingers, size 5 for your upper extremities, size 8 for your lower extremities, in size 11, which will then be cut in half, opened up, and be used for torso. We also have zero form, two different sizes. You're going to have sheets of zero form, which can be cut and used for smaller areas, and then rolls of zero form, which can be unwrapped and wrapped around extremities used for the chest and the trunk and the back. Other main topicals you'll be using are sylvadine and sulfamylon cream, both 400 gram tubes. Blue OR towels, these will be useful for cleaning and debriding your wounds as well as wrapping your wounds up prior to being dressed. Bandage scissors, you'll also find twill tape in your cache. Since we don't typically use commercial devices or tape to secure airway or other sorts of tubes, when you're concerned about someone that has a facial burn or other facial swelling due to fluid resuscitation, twill tape will be used to secure your tubes. Okay, we're going to go into burn cleansing and debridement, and we're actually going to be looking at this as a case presentation. So the objectives of this presentation are to give you background to the patient, a brief assessment of the burn and the burn wounds, and cleansing and debridement of the burn wounds. On our background, this is a little six-month-old guy who was visiting in from out of town with his family. Uh, they were staying in a local hotel when the mother attempted to bathe her kid in a sink in the hotel. Uh, unfortunately, the water came out of the faucet much hotter than mom had expected. Looking at these burn wounds, we can see that there's approximately an 8 to 10% total body surface area burn, 
which includes the right thigh, the perineum, and the anterior abdominal wall. Now take a look at the right thigh and the right abdominal wall and notice the sparing of the injury. You can see where the leg was creased, where the leg creases, and where the thigh may have pushed against the abdomen, which shows that the leg was probably flexed at the time of injury. So when looking at these wounds, we can see a few things. We have intact bulli. This is actually a great shot of a fluid-filled bulli. On the anterior thigh, you have some red dry appearance on that wound. This is probably where the hot water actually made direct point of contact. Make careful observation, especially in children, of perineal burns and the functionality and as well as looking at the prospective swelling of the urinary meatus. This was going to let you know if you're going to need to catheterize these patients or not. All of these burns are a combination of superficial and deep partial thickness burns. The areas that we can see of initial superficial burns are the perineum and the medial thigh. The rest of the thigh has a little bit of a deeper appearance, which would be the deep partial thickness burns. So now for wound cleansing and debridement. Using antibacterial soap, or even using a substance like baby shampoo, and a clean cloth and water, remove all debris, including loose tissue and bulli. Just break them open, pull them off. Be gentle, but be able to clean the wound effectively. Now that the wounds have been thoroughly cleansed and debrided, where do we go from here? So this is when the provider can come in and actually make a decision on what topical agents to order. Given what you guys are going to be having in your burn cache, Silvadine will probably be the most likely choice of topical agents to use. In this section, we're going to be discussing burn wound products. Uh, we are going to be looking at some things uh, definitely in your cache, and we're also going to be discussing some items that you may find outside of your cache, but may be indicated for patients, especially those that may be staying with you greater than 72 hours in an obscure situation. First things we're going to be looking at are the topical antimicrobials. These include sulfur sulfadiazine, otherwise known as sylvidine, maffinite acetate cream, otherwise known as silver myelin, and triple antibiotic ointment. Uh, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we are going to be looking at maffinite acetate or sulfur myelin powder, which can be used as a solution, and double antibiotic ointment. Uh, the enzymatic agents are not in your cache, but it's another very commonly used topical agent um, that you may have to utilize later down the road if your patients stay with you for a little longer time. Uh, other products that we'll be looking at are uh, the silver products, which are the newer nanotechnology products. Uh, once again, though, that's something that's not readily found in your cache. And then uh, Zeroform, which is something that you will be having and uh, will be utilizing uh, on a pretty extensive basis. Sulfur sulfadiazine, sylvidine, used to be known as the gold standard for wound care. Uh, now it is generally used uh, for the deeper third degree burns and uh, those with leathery eschar. So the active ingredient is sylvidine. It's synthesized from silver nitrate and sodium sulfadiazine. Comes in a 1% concentration of water soluble cream base. It's relatively painless to apply. Does not stain bed linens or other objects like the old school silver nitrate used to. The moisture of the cream does provide relief from itchiness uh, that is associated with the wound healing process. So the indication for using sulfur sulfadiazine, we're going to use it in burn wounds to reduce wound bacteria density and delay colonization with gram-negative bacteria specifically. Applied once or twice daily, usually twice daily, on superficial dermal second and third degree burns. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, you may start seeing a yellow-gray pseudo eschar that can form several days after using the cream. That's why it's exceptionally important to uh, exhibit good wound care and uh, aggressive cleaning with these wounds, especially those in sylvidine. It does produce in vitro activity against uh, Staph aureus, E. coli, Klebsiella species, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the Proteus species, uh, as well as have some action against Candida albicans. Some adverse reactions to watch out with sylvidine can cause a cutaneous reaction, most likely a maculopapular rash. It uh, can cause an acute hemolytic anemia that's related to the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency. Also can cause a transient leukopenia uh, with decreased neutrophil counts. Now we're going to look at maffinite acetate cream in solution, otherwise known as sulfamylon. Uh, sulfamylon cream is something that you're going to find readily in your cache. Sulfamylon solution is one of those uh, items that is readily used, but you're not going to be utilizing unless your patients are going to be staying with you for a longer amount of time. 
or your patients have become grafted. So, sulfamylon cream, active ingredient. Comes, uh, it's available as an 11.1% concentration water-soluble cream base and a 5% concentration solution. Uh, we're going to be generally looking at the cream base 11.1 concentration. Indication, it has antibacterial activity against the gram-positive species, including clostridiums, and broad activity against most of the gram-negative pathogens isolated from burn wounds has minimal antifungal activity and limited activity against methicillin resistant strains. It does have rapid absorption through open wounds with local concentration sharply reduced requiring twice a day applications. It's excellent for eschar penetration which is useful for short term control of burn wound infections. Now keep in mind with uh, the mafenide acetate cream it can be a little more on the painful side to apply. It can uh, sting a little with the initial application. It is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So one thing that you need to watch out for, uh, especially if you have patients requiring a large body surface area of sulfamylon application, is uh, due to the nature of the drug that uh, you can run into a metabolic acidosis. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, we're going to look into the mafenide acetate solution a little bit just so uh, everyone's aware that uh, it is out there and what it's used for. It's a 5% topical solution. It's provided in packets of 50 grams of sterile mafenide acetate, and it's to be reconstituted in a liter of sterile water for irrigation. All you do is just pour the powder into the bottle of water and give it a good shake. We use it as an adjunctive topical antimicrobial agent to control the infection under most dressings over meshed autographs and uh, excised burn wounds as well. Now we're going to look into the double and triple antibiotic ointments. Um, you may have both of these in your cache, or you may just have one of them, but just for the, for the point of reference, we're going to go over both. Um, you can see here on the slide, um, the first one, double antibiotic ointment, uh, it has two components to it, bacitracin zinc and polymyxin B sulfate. Um, comparing that to the triple antibiotic ointment, which you have bacitracin zinc, neomycin sulfate, as well as polymyxin B sulfate. So the indication of use for these ointments, generally they're a first aid to prevent minor infection and cut scrapes and burns. These ointments have efficacy against gram-positive cocci and the aerobic gram-negative bacilli. Uh, generally we tend to save the triple antibiotic ointment for use in adults and children over the age of two. This item is not in your cache, but we uh, definitely think that it's important to go over. This is collagenase or santal ointment. This uh, is in the family of the enzymatic debriders. You may need to rely on this ointment, uh, especially if your patients are going to be staying with you a little longer or you get a pretty big wave of them. So the active ingredient in this, it's a sterile enzymatic debriding ointment which contains collagenase, has 250 units per one gram of white petroleum. It's derived from the fermentation by the Clostridium histolyticum. It has the ability to di digest collagen and necrotic tissue, and it breaks up and removes dead skin and tissue. It does not hurt or harm the surrounding healthy skin um, around a wound. So we use it to help heal burns and skin ulcers. Uh, you apply it to the area once or twice daily, preferably twice daily, and uh, cover it with zero form and then affix it with a burn bandage. It is desirable if you can, if you're using this product, to cross-hatch some thick eschar that you may see on some of these wounds and uh, helps loosen up some of that tissue prior to the uh, collagenase application. Okay, now we're going to look into Xeroform. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Xeroform. It's, it's not an uncommon substance in, in most hospitals. Uh, but we're going to look into it a little more for the, the utilization of burn care. It's a yellow gauze bathed in petroleum jelly. It has a 3% bismuth tribromophenate antibiotic salt. When used in regular bandaging, it may adhere to an open wound, but it will pull away easily. So it'll keep whatever topicals you have down on there, but uh, it won't hurt the patient as you try to pull it off. It does have a little bit of an anti-stick property to it. It's indicated for the use on chest tubes, new circumcisions, skin graft donor sites, and other wounds. Generally what we use it for is to cover any of our ointment topicals, like the double or triple antibiotic ointments, uh, putting it over the top of the collagenase or santal if you ever have the opportunity to use that, as well as covering up donor sites in case you get to a point with your patients that you have to do some emergent grafting. Uh, it can also be used to cover up donor sites as well. I'm just going to briefly go into Acticope. 
Uh, this is some of the new, newer silver nanotechnology uh, products that are out there on the market for burn care as well as wound care. So some of you may be familiar with this and have seen it before. Uh, Ectacote is a silver impregnated gauze. It is impregnated with silver nanocrystals. It's uh, three layered and it has a silver side and a blue side. Either side does contain the silver crystals and they're activated by uh, the immersion in sterile water. You don't want to soak it, you just want to moisten it and lay it on top of the wound. And then usually you just moisten um, the outside of the dressing that's holding the ectocote on every four to six hours just to keep that uh, silver releasing. It does come in varying strengths, if you will. Um, it's either any a daily change, a three-day change, or a seven-day change format. So we're going to discuss in this module um, the basics of wound care. Uh, things that we're going to go over as a brief overview are techniques of bandaging extremities and torso. Uh, we're going to look at more of the difficult areas to bandage like the head, the face, um, the upper extremities including the hands and the lower extremities including the feet. Uh, we're also going to be looking at wrapping and netting of the burn bandages and uh, we're going to wrap it up with elevating the upper extremities and Murphy slings for when you have circumferential upper extremity burns. Uh, I'll also go over all the topicals that we'll use in different areas of the body and, and their different uses for those areas. First thing that we're going to start with is the head. If you have a patient that has come in with a head and facial burns, uh, one of the first things you're going to want to do that we recommend is to shave the hair. Um, so shaving the head completely and on male patients uh, a good thing to do every day that we recommend is to shave their face daily when uh, you're doing wound care. So after you shave their head, just clean them very well with soap and water as we've recommended. Uh, then we're going to move into the utilization of our topicals. Um, for the head, anything from the crown of the head back is uh, good to use the sulfamylon or silvadine creams. But uh, around the mucous membranes, we're going to be utilizing polysporin ointment. The reason that we do this is that uh, polysporin ointment is uh, safe to use around the mucous membranes and won't harm the eyes and uh, get into the mouth and nose. So the first thing that we're going to do is apply some polysporin ointment in a light film to, um, to the face. Just kind of give it a nice wipe all over. And uh, then we're going to follow that up with some zero form. And zero form that is going to be in your cache is going to come in a roll. And uh, how we're going to do this is just take the roll and uh, we're going to cut it off into best way to do it, uh, as far as I found, is to just put it in strips over the, the areas. So if you're doing a whole facial burn, you can just start up here, snip it off. Also what you're going to want to do is to cut out spots for the eyes, being very careful after you place it, because to try to do this before you get it on there, your eyes are going to be looking like a Picasso painting. You're going to have one up here and one over here. So you're going to cut out spots for the eyes, as well as the nose and the mouth, as I mentioned before. Doesn't have to be an art project. Just make sure that they have good access around their eyes. Easy way to do this too is to just put a slit up the nose and spread it out on each side. So you're pretty much just giving them a bandit mask at this point. And then one more down here, and this will be for around the mouth. Now if you're doing a full head dressing, as I mentioned before, you're going to be putting your creams on like Sylvadine or Sulfamylon. And a good way to do this is to take now your burn bandage. I kind of like to take a bandana approach to doing this because that gives you good coverage of the head. Fold it corner to corner. Place it down behind their neck and head. Now, ear burns are kind of a follow a different suit. For ear burns, since uh, you're dealing with cartilage, which obviously our ear is made of, we tend to use sulfamylon cream because for um, a reason unbeknownst to us, sulfamylon cream tends to penetrate cartilaginous tissue better than any of the other topicals. 
So how we're going to do this is you just take some 4x4s, take the sulfamylon cream and just take a nice swipe of it like so. And you just smoosh it onto the air. Now you take this little bandana, pull it up around our head like so. So it's going to stabilize this head dressing. You can pad this up a little more too, depending on how big of the burn you're dealing with on someone's head. Then we're going to take Curlix, trying to keep their eyes from being covered, and then just wrap their head. Doesn't have to be super tight, just tight enough that your dressing is going to stay secure. Keeping in mind also to leave room for their mouth. And follow it up with a stretch net. Tie a little knot on top so you've got a little closure. And we're just going to slide it over the top of the head, down over the face. And then we're going to cut out a little area right here so they have a little window. You want to cut just enough off to give them a window outside, but not taking too much or you're going to lose the integrity of the stretch not keeping your dressing intact. And that is how you do a head and face bandage. Just for added point of reference, the reason that we put the zero form over the polysporin ointment is uh, double fold. A, it keeps the dressings from sticking, and B, it keeps a moist wound environment uh, so the facial burns do not dry out and uh, cause more of a problem than you've already started with. So that's why we utilize the zero form over the polysporin ointment. Now we're going to review the wrapping of an upper extremity as well as one of the more difficult areas to wrap, which is a hand. Uh, as stated before, you're going to clean and debride the wound as you normally would, removing blisters or any dead tissue, and that's just through the utilization of uh, soap and water and getting the wounds clean. So you're going to expose the whole entire area. Uh, we like to use some of the blue sterile towels or any of the other OR towels that you may have on hand. And just place these under. Then what we're going to do is um, depending on which cream that we're using. There's two different creams that we'll utilize for this type of dressing. We're either going to be using sulfamylon cream or sylvadine cream. What we recommend is using sulfamylon cream for your morning dressing, sylvadine cream for your PM dressing. The reason behind this is sulfamylon has a greater penetration rate than the sylvadine does. With that being said, it can cause a little more pain. Also, another thing to remember is that due to the nature of sulfamylon cream, on larger total body surface area burns, let's say over 30-40%, uh, due to that penetration rate, it can cause as a side effect metabolic acidosis. So that's just something else to keep in mind. So for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to be using sulfamylon cream. Uh, so after you have cleaned the wound, this is going to be a little cold on the patient, um, you're just going to apply it in a generous layer. all over the entire arm. No real science to it. So we'll do the uh, upper extremity first. After you get a nice coat of the sulfamylon cream over it, one thing to keep your hand nice and clean is to just wipe it off with the bandage. Great way to do this is to put the corner of the bandage up under the axilla. Have the patient lay their arm down into it and then wrap it like so. We're going to leave the hand exposed for now because the hand will be done as a separate dressing. But then we'll connect it all together. Then we'll just double up another burn bandage for the upper part of the upper extremity and your axilla is already covered from how we did it prior. And we're just going to leave the arm alone for now. We're going to wrap this all together at the end. So the hand, what we use is a 4x4 boat. Take a little sulfamylon cream and you're going to wrap each digit individually, like so. Then you're going to take some of your stretch netting, making sure that you cut it in long enough pieces. You can always trim it back later. People tend to cut these a little short, so longer is better. Just take it and stretch it over each digit, like so. Remembering if you're doing escherotomies, again on the hands and the arms, same principle, 
that you're going to want to uh, clean the wounds and then with the uh, sulfamylin or silvadine cream, whichever topical you're using, you're going to want to pack those. Um, for this, since we already have the 4x4s out, good way to pack an escrotomy site, especially on the hand or the arm, is to take some of the sulfamylon cream, roll it up in your hand as so, and pull it out making a rope. Then you would place it down inside of the escrotomy site and then wrap as I'm going to continue doing. Um, but this will be done on the hands, the arms, legs, chest, or wherever your escrotomies uh, may be. We'll just continue wrapping each finger individually. And the reason that we're wrapping the fingers individually is uh, so that you can maintain the space between the fingers and the webbing and that you don't get them wadded up into one big contracted ball. Um, it's a great way for contractures to begin is to wrap the hands uh, all together. And keeping in mind that uh, as far as contractures go, that uh, the point of comfort is the point of contracture. And as you can see, wrapping fingers can be a little daunting, but your time will pay off in the long run for your patient's sake. Okay, now you've got each finger wrapped. You have two choices here. You can either wrap the rest of the hand with 4x4s and sulfamylon cream or use burn gauze. I tend to just kind of put a 4x4 with sulfamylon on like so. Now we're going to grab some Curlex and we're going to wrap the extremity. Starting down at the hand and working up. I tend to put the curlics in between the thumb and then continue up the hand and then up the arm. You don't want to make it too tight, but you want to keep it tight enough where it's going to keep your dressing in place from sliding all over, especially if your patients are going to be mobile, moving around the bed, walking around. Uh, you just want to make sure that this is going to be a nice stable dressing for them so they don't have to go through another dressing change later because the dressing was too loose. And then take some stretch net that would be appropriate for the arm, depending on obviously your patient size. We're going to put this over here. Little trick of the trade, make a little hole here for the thumb, it'll help hold it on. And then you can just stretch it up the arm. And that is the dressing of an upper extremity and hand. Now we're going to go over elevation in a Murphy sling for an upper extremity burn. Uh, the reason that we're going to do this is twofold. It's going to help decrease edema, keep the edema down in a circumferential burn, and uh, it's also going to help promote venous return. So how we're going to do this is uh, you're going to utilize some sort of rounded cage apparatus like we have here. Then you're going to pull the stretch netting down over it keeping it held on the whole time, because if not, it's going to pop off of there like a rubber band. So you just keep pulling this down over the top of this. Now, how you're going to um, hang this is if you are in um, a hospital room like an ICU, you uh, may have sky hooks in your room, the hooks that hang from the ceiling, or if not, um, empty IV poles work wondrous as well. Just put one on each side of the bed if you've got bilateral burns. Okay, now that you have it over the ring, just put it up over the extremity like so. Pop it off the one end. Take it down to this end. Cut a hole in the top. And then uh, usually twill tie works best. Or if you've got enough fabric on the end of it to just hang it from here, but you can also take some twill tie. Uh, elevate the extremity with a couple of pillows and then hang it from whatever apparatus you have to keep your extremity up. Um, you may also want to uh, cut a hole in the dressing as well as the Murphy sling here so you can access the uh, radial artery so you can do neurovascular checks with the Doppler. Now we're going to go over wrapping of the lower extremity in the foot. Again, the foot being one of the more difficult areas to wrap. For the sake of training, I'm not going to discuss the application of the topicals again, but we're just going to discuss the wrapping of the extremity itself. So as we've discussed before, 
uh, in the same fashion, you're going to clean and debride the wound, open, taking care of all of the blisters and uh, debriding all the dead tissue that is visible to you at that time. We're going to get rid of that and clean the extremity with uh, soap and water. You're going to use uh, sulfamylon or silvadine creams, whichever uh, dressing change you're on. Reinforcing once again that we recommend alternating between the two, sulfamylon in your daytime dressing and silvadine in your nighttime dressing. Taking a good amount of burn bandage. Um, for the lower and upper extremities, tend to use a thicker amount of bandage because these wounds do tend to weep quite a bit. You just lift up the leg. Once again, placing it in the diamond fashion like this. That gives good coverage over your knee. And then we'll place one more under here. for the rest of the leg. Toes again, uh, much like the hand, you want to keep separated. There are a couple of different ways of doing this. One way is to take um, a piece of 4x4, rolling it around in the cream like you would if you were packing the osteotomies, actually intertwining it in between the toes. Because toes are a little tougher to wrap than uh, hands are. And then once again, we're going to take four by fours. The little toes are especially difficult to do this with, but we're going to try to wrap each toe individually. So for the sake of training purposes, we're not going to wrap each individual toe, but you get the idea of how to wrap uh, the toes individually. You're then going to take some burn gauze, covering up the feet like so, and then taking a curlix. and stabilizing the dressing with Curlix wrap. It's always a good idea after you wrap, especially circumferential burns, to get um, the extremities elevated up on as many pillows as possible. Once again, helping decrease edema formation. Usually a good idea to have someone else holding the extremity while you wrap. But for this intent and purpose, you can pretty much do it yourself if you have to. Then once you get the extremity wrapped, you just grab a piece of stretch net. It's going to be long enough for each leg. And then you're going to put it up over top. Good way to do this if you're by yourself, pop it up on your shoulder and roll it down this way. And that is how we do a leg and foot dressing. Now we're going to discuss doing the back, chest, and abdomen dressings. Uh, how we're going to do this is following the procedures that we had before, cleaning and debriding the wounds on the back and the chest and abdomen, uh, getting rid of all the blisters, dead tissue, and cleaning it off with soap and water. Uh, how we're going to do this is relatively the same as we've done our other dressings, just on a larger, flatter scale. So first things first is to grab a stretch net. This is our largest size. You're going to cut it in half, so you've got one plane of stretch netting. Give it a good couple pulls, because what we're going to do is make a shirt for our patient to hold our dressing on. After you give it some good stretches, you're going to cut your armholes. They don't have to be exact. Just get one on each side. That's what the arms are going to go through. Okay, we're going to move over to our patient. You're going to have them move up onto their uh, side, whichever side is easiest for you to do first. And we're going to tuck some of the dressing under. And you want to leave enough dressing exposed so you can bridge it from your back over to your flank because you're going to have your chest and abdomen to deal with too. So we're going to pull this up and over. Now you're going to grab your stretch netting. You're going to have your patient put their arm through. If you have your Murphy slings on, that's no problem. This is a perfect time to do this. And pull the stretch netting up and over the shoulder. Like I said, we're pretty much making a shirt that's going to help keep our dressings on. A good thing to do at this point is to affix your arm to your back and chest dressing. 
to do this, we use a safety pin with regular thread on it. And you're just going to loosely sew this all together. It doesn't have to be a perfect stitch. You're just doing it for utilitarian purposes, not cosmetic purposes. This is going to help when your patient's moving around in the bed. If you're moving them or they're moving themselves around, it just kind of helps keep all the dressings together instead of sliding all over the place. If it comes up down there, no big deal because we're going to stretch it all out at the end. So now you're just going to tuck it under your patient and then have them roll back towards you. Just kind of tuck it as they go and have them center themselves in the bed a little more. And then have them roll back towards you. And then we're going to pull our netting through like so. Okay, have them lay back again. Now you've got your netting pulled through. Now is an easier time to do your chest and abdomen dressings. Once again, following the same principles. So you're going to lay down the burn gauze over the chest and abdomen, pulling up your flanks. Now we're going to sew up the dressing like so. Good way to do this if you're running solo is to just tie it off in a knot at the bottom. Grab one of our handy dandy sewers and start sewing up the middle. You also can just use knots and put three knots in the dressing from the lower abdomen, mid chest, and then upper chest, or you can sew. The sewing tends to keep the dressings in place a little better. That's why we prefer to sew over tying off. Uh, if you're going to have a completely immobile patient though, tying off your dressings will work just as well. So you can cut this off. And now you can continue sewing posterior to the anterior chest and then sewing the arm to the rest of the chest. All right, now we're going to take a look at daily wound assessment. And now we're going to revert back to the case that you saw a few moments ago of the uh, pediatric patient who suffered the skull burn from being bathed in a hotel sink. As you can see here on post burn day one, uh, the wound has clean edges, uh, is uh, definitely pink, red, and a little pale in appearance. So this gives you the notion that you have uh, superficial as well as deeper partial thickness burns involved in this child. Uh, moving on to post burn day two, especially post burn day two and three, you might want to start thinking of uh, burn wound cellulitis, maybe a complication that may start to form around this time period. Uh, looking at the, at the patient itself, you can see that the burn wounds look a little more pale than they did on post-burn day one. Uh, looks like there may be a little eschar formation on the anterior thigh. Burn wound cellulitis, if you, if you see it, uh, it's definitely going to have an erythematous appearance, which is going to spread beyond the uh, border of the wound about one to two centimeters. And that one to two centimeter uh, erythema is going to be immediately adjacent to the burn wound. Um, Definitely, it's more than likely beta hemolytic strep cellulitis. Um, may not always be the case, but that's usually a likely culprit. And uh, just something to keep in mind as you're checking out these, these patients on a daily basis. Moving on to post burn day three, uh, you can see that the edges are starting to, uh, looks like they're starting to heal. The outside margins of the wound are starting to perhaps heal up nicely. Looks like we, though we have a little stubborn scar in the middle of the wound with uh, a little more of a pale appearance. So there was a decision made at this time that uh, the conservative measures probably would not get as much ground so that we were going to go ahead and take this, this little guy to the operating room. And post burn day four he was taken to the operating room where uh, he was surgically excised and an allograft placement was performed. Um, for those of you that don't know, allograft is donated cadaveric skin that is um, processed, treated, and frozen and then thought out in your operating room um, to cover your patient. So the thought behind allografting is that uh, it's going to stand for about five to ten days 
and there, you're in hopes that under that, that the body will think that there's a covering on that wound and underneath you may start to get some uh, actual wound healing. Uh, if you're getting into day five and uh, things just aren't progressing well, um, the uh, allograft is starting to slime off. It looks like you're getting some exudate under there. Um, you know that you're probably not getting very much healing done. So after uh, he was allografted, you can see here on post burn day four, more of the finished product of the allografting. Post burn day five, which is his post operative day one, you can see that the allograft is um, adherent. So we're going to look at post burn day seven, which is also post operative day three of allograft placement. As you can see on the lower leg, distal to the knee, it looks like the allograft is dried up, starting to peel away and has actually been trimmed away where uh, the tissue has healed underneath. As uh, I mentioned previously, when the allograft is starting to dry up, pull away, it looks like the, the tissue has healed under there, which is great. On post burn day eight though, the decision was made um, that the, the patient would require autografting. The uh, burn that was on the upper thigh, especially the anterior thigh, was deeper than, than the rest of the burns. So a decision was made to go ahead and autograft him. Usual timing of burn wound excision, just for your reference, is uh, we like to have most of the burn wounds excised within the first week, barring uh, any sort of problems with resuscitative measures and uh, keeping in mind that the patient is stable enough to, to go to the operating room at this time. So moving on to post-op day two, uh, you can see that the uh, autograft looks very well adherent. Oh, the staining on the skin and the shiny appearance that you see on the graft itself is uh, from Acticoat dressing, which is the silver nanotechnology dressings that I had discussed prior um, in the wound care section. And I, it does leave a little bit of that silver staining behind, which is actually a good thing because you're getting antimicrobial coverage from that silver. Moving on to post burn day 14, which is his post operative day six from autografting, you can see that the uh, autograft is beautifully adherent to his thigh. Uh, the edges look nicely trimmed. Uh, looking over onto his left thigh, you can see his donor site that is starting to dry up nicely. And uh, the edges are starting to curl up as well, letting us know that that is healing very nicely on him. Priorities of burn wound excision. If you're dealing with a larger burn, you're definitely going to want to take care of those uh, life-saving interventions first, like the chest wall, the abdominal wall, circumferential chest burns, and circumferential trunk burns where you may not be getting uh, good tidal volumes, the patient's from respiratory distress, or they may be developing a, an abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, those would be your first and uh, paramount areas to excise. Uh, next are gonna be your functional areas like your hands, feet, face, 